hello students uh, today we will do the current affairs for uh, the 10th of march uh, 2022 okay today we have a lot of uh, important topics especially uh, the granting of uh, pardon by the governor and the president uh, and also the government has set up a new corporation for uh, monetization of assets um, and then we will discuss about uh, the nabfid uh, which is a development financial institution to fund uh, long term infrastructure projects also uh, we will read uh, more about upi 123 pay which is a new form of payment for feature phones and uh, finally we will conclude with the mines and minerals new amendment uh, bill okay uh, okay okay why are we going to talk about uh, the pardoning powers of the president and the governor it's because the supreme court on uh, wednesday released rajiv gandhi's assassination convict ag perarivalan on bail taking into the account that he has suffered for more than 30 years of imprisonment at the end of a nearly hour long uh, hearing the court listed perarivalan's case for further hearing in april on the powers of the governor to decide the question of his early release which was approved by the tamil nadu cabinet and the governor's reference to the president okay what happened before this was that the tamil nadu cabinet had held that this person perari valan has to be given valan has to be pardoned for his crimes uh but uh, the tamil nadu governor has actually sat on that particular recommendation of the cabinet uh, of ministers and recently he sent it to the uh, president uh and hence this particular case is running in the supreme court whether the governor can uh, pardon convicts in the case of uh, whether the governor can pardon the uh, convicts in the case of life imprisonment or death that is the case that is happening in the supreme court now pardoning powers of the governor please remember that under the indian constitution uh, two power, two people have a uh, pardoning powers in the governor as well as the president however their powers are also very different from each other's uh, powers uh in the case of a governor all of this is for the governor he can pardon reprieve respite remit suspend or commute the punishment or sentence of any person convicted of any offense against a state law whereas in the case of president it will be against a center law also he cannot pardon a death sentence this is the one thing he cannot do though he can do the others he can provide for respite he can provide for reprieve remit suspend or commute even if a state law prescribes for a death sentence the power to grant pardon lies with the president and not the governor however the governor can suspend remit or commute a death sentence like what we just spoke in other words both the governor and the president have concurrent powers they have similar powers when it comes to suspension remission and commutation of death sentence while the president can grant pardon reprieve respite suspension remission or commutation in the case of punishment by a court martial the governor cannot do so hence the governor's powers do not extend to a court martial while this extends in the case of a president he can do this even in the case of court martial please remember these differences uh also if you want to understand what uh, these different different uh, things that we discussed were pardon means completely free even the charges are lifted they can go out completely commutation means that a tougher punishment is uh, you know changed into a lighter punishment remission reducing the period without changing the character of the uh, punishment you reduce the time from 5 years to say 2 years respite giving a lesser sentence in the place of an original one reprieve there is a stay on the execution only for a certain period of time certain period of time now moving on next topic cabinet not for new firm to monetize land assets very important the union cabinet on wednesday approved the setting up of a new government owned firm for 
for pooling and monetizing sovereign and public sector land assets. What is the name of this new firm that has been launched? The National Land Monetization Corporation. And it is being formed with an initial authorized share capital of 5000 crore rupees and a paid up capital of 150 crores. Now, what is this National Land Monetization Corporation? The governor, the government will appoint a chairman to head the NLMC through a merit based selection process and it can also hire private sector professionals with the expertise uh, to head this National Land Monetization Corporation. The National Land Monetization Corporation will undertake monetization of surplus land and building assets of central public sector enterprises as well as of government agencies, both the CPSCs as well as government agencies. And the gov government can appoint people from either the private sector or from the public sector itself in order to manage this uh, National Land Monetization Corporation. Now, what are the functions of these NLMC? It is expected to own hold, manage and monetize surplus land and building assets of CPSCs either under closure and surplus non-core land assets of government owned CPSCs under strategic disinvestment. Either under closure or under strategic disinvestment, it, it will either own, hold, manage and monetize surplus land assets of these uh, CPSCs. It will also speed up the closure process of CPSCs and smoothen the strategic disinvestment process of the CPSCs. These assets may be transferred to the NLMC to either, like what we said, hold, manage and monetize. The NLMC will also advise and support the government entities in identifying their surplus non-core assets and monetizing them in a professional and efficient manner to generate maximum value realization. It will undertake this uh, advising uh, function as an agency function. Okay. It is expected that NLMC will act as a repository of the best practices in land monetization. This will act as a repository. It also provides advice and then it will also take up uh, you know, management of assets of CPSCs either under closure or CPSCs under strategic disinvestment. Now, who does this NLMC comprise of? It comprises of a board of directors that will comprise senior central government officers and eminent experts okay, to enable professional operations and management of the company. It also comprises the chairman and non-government directors of the NLMC will be appointed through a merit-based selection process. For this only, we said that we can have even people from the private sector joining it. Next, moving on. Okay, why does the government need to monetize assets? We know that the government has a national infrastructural pipeline or also uh, recently we have seen that uh, the government wants to produce a scheme called as Gati Shakti for improvement of infrastructure in the country. Let it be roads, let it be communication, let it be waterways, etc. Okay, now. Uh, with monetization of non-core assets, the government will be able to generate substantial revenues by monetizing unused and underused assets. It will also enable productive utilization of these underutilized assets to trigger private sector investments, new economic activities, boost the local economies and etc. Hence, this is the reason why the government wants to go for monetizing these assets so that other infrastructure can be set up. Upper age limit for NEET UG has been removed. Okay, the National Medical Commission recently removed the upper age limit for appearing in the National Eligibility Come Entrance Test. Now, what is the NMC? NMC is also known as the National Medical Commission. And this is in charge of all uh, regulating the medical education and medical professionals in India. Okay, and it is the National Testing Agency which, uh, which conducts the NEET exam the national uh, eligibility come entrance test earlier the age limit was 25 years for general category candidates and 30 for those in the reserved category now this limits have been lifted and any now any age up till any age you can uh, keep writing the neat pg i mean the neat exam neat ug 
Now, what is this National Medical Commission? The National Medical Commission, like what we had discussed, it is in charge for regulating all the uh, medical education and medical professionals in India. It had replaced the earlier Medical Com Council of India. Okay. Now, this NMC was formed under the National Medical Commission Act. The NMC will function as the country's top regulator of medical education. It has four autonomous boards. Undergraduate Medical Education Board, Postgraduate Medical Education Board, Medical Assessment and Rating Board, and Ethics and Medical Registration Board. All these four boards are autonomous boards which are under the National Medical Commission itself. Now, the common final year Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery MBBS examination will also be known as the National Exit Test. Now, all these doctors who want to start practicing, they need to pass this next test okay according to the nmc act the next will act as the licensiate exam to practice medicine so unless and until you pass this exam you cannot practice medicine also the criterion for admission into postgraduate medical courses for uh, pg in medicine needs marks from next only if they score good marks in the next test will they get good uh, admission in the PG process. Also, uh, people who have studied MBBS in foreign universities, once they come back, they need to clear the next exam to be able to practice in India. The next will also be applicable to institutes of national importance such as All India Institute of Medical Sciences in a bit to ensure a common standard in the medical education sector in the country. Now, what is this NMC? How many people does it comprise of? It comprises of 33 people. It has one chairperson and comprises of 10 ex officio members and 22 part time members. Uh, ex officio members will be chairman of those four autonomous uh, boards uh, that we you know, just discussed undergraduate medical education board, postgraduate medical education board. All these boards' chairmen will also be ex officio members of this National Medical Commission. Now, the function of the National Medical Commission is to lay down policies for regulating medical institutions and medical professionals, assessing the requirements of human resources and infrastructure in the healthcare. After assessing, if it feels that there is a need to increase the infrastructure and human resources, it will take the necessary steps. It also ensures compliance by the state medical councils with the regulations made under the bill. So, once the NMC has made any regulations, any new orders or rules, uh, it will ensure that the state medical councils uh, are in line with those uh, changes that are made. Okay. Framing guidelines for determining the fee up to 50% of the seats in the private medical institutions. So, the NMC will be responsible for uh, determining the fee of around 50% of the students in private medical education, uh, private medical institutions. Uh, it is going to be replacing the Medical Council of India and it is a statutory body. NABFID to be regulated as an All India Financial Institution under the RBI Act. Uh, RBI had recently announced that NABFID will be supervised as an All India Financial Institution under the RBI Act. Remember under which act it can be asked under the prelims. Okay, It shall be the fifth All India Financial Institution after Exim Bank, NABAD, NHB, SIDB. These are the existing four All India Financial Institutions and NABFID will be the fifth one. It has been set up as a development financial institution to support the development of long term infrastructure financing in India. Unlike banks, the development financial institutions do not accept deposits from people. They source funds rather from the market or the government as well as multilateral institutions like ADB, like World Bank, IMB, IM, IMF, sorry. Uh, okay. Now, the National Bank for Financing Infrastructure and Development Act was enacted to form the NABFID. Hence, what is NABFID? It is a statutory body. And it provides uh, financing for long term infrastructure projects. Now, more about NABFID. See, I have gone through the entire act and most of the things that they can ask you from NABFID, I have mentioned it over here. The other functions or other uh, details which are not so important, I have tried skipping it. Hence, please read all the points over here. Now, 
NABFID will be set up as a corporate body with an authorized share capital of 1 lakh crore rupees. And the shares of NABFID will be held by central government, multilateral institutions, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, insurers, financial institutions, banks. Okay. Initially, the central government will have 100% of the shares. And later, the central government will read can reduce it to 26% of the shares in case the government wants to give a bigger role to the private sector. It can keep reducing its uh, stake and it can increase the stake of the private sector. NABFID can raise money either in the form of Indian rupees or in the form of foreign currencies. Okay, now the NABFID has two functions. It has both financial functions as well as developmental objectives. Now financial uh, objectives will be to either directly or indirectly lend, invest or attract investments for infrastructure projects located entirely or partly in India. Okay. Only those projects which are either located partly or entirely in India can be funded by uh, NABFID. Not the projects which are completely outside the territory of India. Now, it also has a developmental uh, function such as uh, it includes facilitating the development of the market for bo bonds, loans and derivatives for infrastructure financing. Hence, it has a two-fold role, both financing normally and also developing those institutions uh, which can finance infrastructure projects further. Now, what are the functions of NABFID? It extends loans and advances for infrastructure projects, taking over or refinancing such existing loans. If in case these loans are not workable for the banks and the banks want to uh, uh, pull out of these loans, hence the NABFID can refinance these uh, loans and they can continue these loans. Attract investments from private sector investors and institutional investors for infrastructure projects. Organizing and facilitating foreign participation in infrastructure projects. Okay. Also, it provides consultancy services in infrastructure financing. Hence, it has several functions which are very important in nature. War risks weighing Indian companies face higher reinsurance rates. Okay. First, we need to understand what reinsurance is. Okay. When any company takes a, a guarantee, it is known as insurance. However, in the case of uh, calamity, even these insurance companies can get affected. Hence, insurance companies also go for further insurance of the policies that they've given. And this is known as reinsurance. Earlier in India, General Insurance Corporation, GIC, only used to provide for reinsurance. However, since liberalization, India has allowed many foreign companies to provide for reinsurance. Now, why is it in the news? That is the most important part about reinsurance. Global reinsurers have intimated the Indian general insurers about the hardening of pricing and tighter norms and uh, terms and conditions for Indian businesses in the wake of Russian invasion of Ukraine and subsequent imposition of sev severe sanctions by the Western countries on Russia. Now, uh, so global in reinsurers have told the Indian in insurers that there might be higher risks for Indian insurance companies and uh, this is because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And hence, domestic general insurers, uh, companies like LIC, you know, and the other insurance companies which are domestic, they were, which were waiting for April 1st reinsurance renewal, might have to push for early renewals of their annual business to avoid a price hike. And hence, these insurance companies, they believe that the more time it takes, these reinsurance companies will start charging a higher amount of premium. And hence, normal insurance companies want to go for uh, as soon as possible for reinsurance so that they get it at a cheaper price. Okay. Uh, actually, most of it is very simple. Now, it is the Insurance Act of 1938 which requires insurance companies to take reinsurance on their business. Now, these higher pricings it will usually be impacting marine cargo, particularly movements in Black Sea. And if war continues, it can include property prices also. So this is where higher reinsurance will happen, especially in marine sector and in the property sector. Karevas of India. 
Now, what are Karevas? Karevas are these highland areas in uh, Kashmir which are known for cultivation of saffron. Uh, more about Karevas. The reason why it is in the news is because in the name of development, Kashmir's highly fertile alluvial soil deposits known as Karevas, they are being digged up and they are being destroyed. Despite its agricultural and archaeological importance, Karevas are now being excavated to be used in construction. Karevas are nothing but thick deposits of glacial clay and other materials embedded in moraines. Moraine is nothing but a glacial landform. Okay. They are made up of glaciers and clay in those glaciers and hence it is known as glacial clay. Okay. Now, these are unconsolidated lacustrine deposits which means that they are associated with lakes and water. So, karevas are nothing but glacial clay and they are as associated with lacustrine deposits. They are associated with lakes. How were they formed in Kashmir Valley? Okay, Kashmir Valley right now it resides between the Great Himalayas and the Pir Palmchal ranges. So, Karakoram range. Over here we have the Great Himalayas and over here, uh, somewhere over here we would have the Pir Panjal range. So, between this, this particular region would be the region for uh, Karevas. It is nothing but a thick glacial clay like what we said. In earlier times, when the upliftment of the Pir Panjal ranges happened, the flow of rivers had stopped. Why? Because Pir Panjal range started blocking these rivers from flowing. Okay, and because the uh, rivers were blocked from flowing, this entire Kashmir valley, it became a large lake full of water. Slowly, the glacial deposits had accumulated here in this lake, thus creating a lacustrine plain. Okay, now, after some time, when the river started making dents in the mountains and they started flowing through the mountains, then this water was removed. The water got drained away and these unconsolidated deposits remained over there. These glacial deposits remained over there. And hence, Karevas are nothing but glacial clay deposits. And they are also associated with rivers and uh, lakes. These unconsolidated gravel and mud deposits are known as Karevas. They are unconsolidated. What is the importance of Kareva? They have different soils and sediments such as sand, clay, silt, shale, mud, lignite, loises, etc. And hence they are very useful for agriculture and horticultural activities because they contain the properties of all of this. They contain porosity. They also have permeability. And hence that increases the uh, fertility of the soil and they become very useful for agriculture and horticulture. Kareva formation are used for cultivation of saffron which is a local variety of saffron in the Kashmir Valley. They are also important for the cultivation of almond, walnut, apple, orchards, etc. Several items. UPI 123 pay. Now why is this particular thing in the news? The Reserve Bank of India has launched a new unified payments interface uh, solution for feature phones uh, dubbed as UPI 123 pay. Now what is a feature phone? A feature phone is depicted over here. While you have Android touch phones or Apple touch phones, a feature phone uses buttons and it doesn't have any such uh, technology, okay, a high technology. Now, UPI 123Pay is a three-step method to initiate and execute services for users, which will work on simple phones also. Okay, It can allow customers to use feature phones for almost all transactions except scanning and paying. This is not allowed on these phones. It doesn't need an internet connection for transactions and can work without any internet also. Okay, but however, customers need to link uh, their uh, phone numbers with their bank accounts in order to use this facility. The bank account has to be linked to the feature phone. Now, there are many different ways of 
uh, doing a particular transaction through UPI on this UPI 1, 2, 3 uh, system. Okay. These four ways of doing a UPI transaction are first is through interactive voice response which means that through a normal call you can make a UPI transaction or you can have an app on feature phones itself even feature phones uh, some feature, feature phones still use apps so through this apps you can use uh, UPI or you can use it through a missed call there is a missed call facility for also uh, completing UPI transactions in this case you have to give a missed call and then uh, the customer will receive an incoming call on the same number and then he has to authenticate that particular uh, call with the UPI PIN okay also there is the fourth way of paying through UPI 123 pay which is the proximity sound based payment uh, based on uh, proximity based on proximity the phone can sense and it can ensure contactless and offline payments okay now okay the next topic that we'll discuss is the amendment to mines and minerals development act mmdr so this act is usually in the news always uh, though the act was enacted in the year 1957 it has been regularly amended uh, till as late as uh, 2015 and then finally in 2020 also it was amended and now we have a further amendment in the year 2022 currently the reason why it is in the news is because the union cabinet has approved certain amendments to the second schedule of the mines and minerals development and regulations act for specifying the rate of royalty in the case of gloconite potash emerald platinum and its group elements andalusite silimanite and molybdenum uh, in the year 2020, I believe there was a question related to uh, what are the minerals which can be regulated under the MMDR Act. Uh, please read it. Uh, I don't remember the question exactly, but I guess it was related to what are the major minerals and what are the minor minerals in India. That could be answered if at all you had read the MMDR Act. Now, what is this amendment? Uh, you know setting up of this rate of royalty for these elements will ensure auctioning of mineral blocks for gloconite potash emerald platinum andalusite molybdenum for the first time in the country now minerals like gloconite and potash are used as fertilizers in the agricultural uh, in the agricultural industry while platinum and the other group metals are used in jewelry and other uh, applications minerals like andalusite molybdenum are vital minerals and they are used in industrial applications and hence if at all the government has specified you know the rates of uh, royalty there will be more private players who can start mining these minerals and hence we will uh, depend lesser on imports implications of this move encouraging the indigenous mining of these minerals is in the national interest as it will reduce the imports of potash fertilizers and other minerals. We can save up forex. Okay. The step taken by the Ministry of Mines is also expected to increase the generation of employment in the mining sector. It will also ensure that there is an increased availability of minerals for the downstream industries, for the industries that come up later on. Like say for example molybdenum, if its uh, production is increased, molybdenum can be used in steel in order to uh, increase the in, in order to produce stainless steel okay and hence increased production of molybdenum will result in increased production of stainless steel also uh, this stainless steel industry would be a downstream industry the approval will lead to import substitution in respect of many important minerals from for the country thereby saving uh, valuable forex reserves okay now this mines and minerals act i'll tell some of the amendments which were done okay in the year 2015 we had an amendment related to uh, auction it was decided that uh, mines and minerals would only be sold through auctions and not through any uh, 
contracts on the basis of first come first serve and all okay and later on in the year 2020 uh, we had several such amendments the first amendment being that in the case of coal or lignite the government can start providing for composite prospecting and mining leases for both prospecting and mining can be done on the same lease it's known as a composite uh, license this can be provided as according to the 2020 amendment now the second amendment is that there is a removal of restriction on the end usage of coal hence companies will now be allowed to carry on coal mining operation for own consumption or for sale both can be done companies can do either earlier coal blocks were divided into captive and non captive uh, mines okay captive mines had to use coal only for uh, own pur purposes they could not sell coal on the market and hence now this restriction has been done away with also uh, there were some other amendments such as transfer of statutory clearances to new bidders uh, the act it provided that the various approvals licenses which were given to the previous lessee will be extended to the successful bidder for a period of two years now for a period of two years all those licenses which the previous licensee had they will be given to the new bidder okay new person new bidder uh, this is known as the transfer of statutory licenses clearances also advance action for auction Ad advance action for auction was introduced now this is nothing but under the mmdr act mining leases for specified minerals are auctioned only on the expiry of the lease period now this new amendment it provides that the state governments can take advance action for auction of mining lease even before its expiry even before the expiry of that particular mining lease the state government can take action for auctioning it okay 